Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, part seven of topic four in our database class, I'm going to talk about binary relationships and importantly, cardinalities and their application in our entity relationship models. Let's see some binary relationships and uh, we'll take a look at these crow's foot symbols and we'll see how they can be used to convey design information easily to the viewer, who in this case is us. So in this first example, we have a one-to-one -one binary relationship. It's one-to-one -one because both ends of this relationship line are indicating the concept of one. And in this case, we're looking at a relationship between an employee and a locker. So if we read the relationship in this way, we would say each employee has one locker or is assigned to one locker because the end of this line here in indicates the concept of one. And if we read the same relationship in the opposite direction, that is in the direction from locker to employee, we would say something like each locker is assigned to or belongs to one and only one employee. Okay. So a locker in this example cannot be assigned to more than one employee at a time, and an employee cannot have more than one locker at a time based on the design that we see conceptually illustrated here. I do want to just take half a step back for a moment, and I want you all to understand that when you look at a single relationship line, like you see here, there's just one relationship line connecting these tables. Whenever we see that in a binary relationship, we need to keep in mind that we can read that relationship in two different directions, okay? And I'm using the verb read here. I don't know if there's a better one, but to maybe describe. But the, the whole idea is that uh, this relationship is not just static, but uh, it just depends on our perspective. If we're looking at it, our perspective is from the direction of employee to locker, then we would describe the relationship in one way. We would say like an employee has a locker. But if we look at that same connection in the opposite direction, that is in the direction from locker to employee, we would say something like each locker is assigned to one employee. Okay. So this idea of reading a relationship in both directions is important. Right? It helps us to understand, to more fully understand the nature of the connection between the two entities that are involved in the binary relationship. So that's a one-to-one, -one, easy enough. Here we see a one-to-many. One-to-many's are by far the most common type of relationship that we see, at least on average, in entity relationship diagrams. And the idea here is to convey the idea or, or convey the notion that each entity instance in one of these entities is potentially related to multiple instances in the other entity. So in our little world here, what we're seeing is, or we're seeing illustrated is a connection between employees and departments. And this is indicating to us this relationship line, conceptual relationship line that we see here, that this is a one-to-many relationship in the direction from department to employee. So if we read this relationship in that direction, we would say each department has many, or potentially has many employees, maybe is allowed to have many employees would be a a better way of understanding it in this particular business context. So each department is allowed to have many employees. And we have our symbol for many here. If we read this same relationship in the opposite direction, that is in the direction from employee to department, we would say each employee belongs to or works in just one department. So again, and we need to consider both directions if we want to fully understand the nature of the relationship between these two entities. In the direction from department to employee, it's a many. That is, each department can have many employees. In the direction from employee to department, it is a one. Each employee works in just one department. Hmm. 
curious. Next, we're going to see a conceptual many-to-many -many relationship. And again, I want to, I, I know I've said it before, I need to just say this over and over and over again. This is a concept, this notion of many-to-many, -many, but we cannot actually implement that. So that is a complete entity relationship model would never contain something like this because it simply cannot be implemented as a physical database, right? We understand it easily as humans, like the relationship here between items and suppliers is many to many, but we cannot implement this directly in a real world database. So conceptually though, it's easy for us to understand, right? If we think of the relationship in both directions, in the direction from item to supplier, this tells us that each item can have many suppliers. Right? And if we look at the same relationship in the direction from supplier to item, we say each supplier can provide us with or supply us with many different items. So again, conceptually as, as humans, it's easy for us to understand this notion of many to many, but we cannot implement this directly in a real world relational database. Instead, whenever we encounter a, a many to many situation like this to actually implement it, we need to add a third table to sit between the other two tables. So let me just illustrate that here with this particular example, since it's currently on our minds. So we have items and we have suppliers, All right? And then these are related to each other. So here's my items over here and these are my suppliers. Well, that's supposed to be a supplier. Oh, there we go. And uh, currently we have this kind of design, which shows them conceptually related as a many to many. Now we cannot again, actually implement this instead, what we need to do to implement this conceptual many to many in a real world database is we need to add a third table. So let's take a look at that sort of design here, third table in between. And we'll interconnect these with relationship lines. And we'll see that the many side flips to touch the table in between. Now I will label the table. <laughs> That's a line that Eminem can borrow from me. Label the table. And all right, so we have items there on the left, suppliers over here on the right. And in the middle, we might have this third table might be cleverly named something like, I don't know, item supplier, All right, the combination of the two attached tables. Okay. So in summary, then this is easy for us to understand as humans, that there's a many to many relationship between items and suppliers. However, we are unable to implement that directly in a relational database to implement it. What we need to do is add a third table, a lookup table, an intersection table that will allow us to keep track of the connections between items and suppliers. So again, you can imagine some sort of design here where if we see it from a data perspective, where it might look, say a little something like this. So our item supplier table might have an item ID and a supplier ID. And if we leave it at that, just that simple idea, uh, filling in these things, we might have like item one is provided by supplier 10 and item two is provided by supplier number 10 and item three is provided by supplier 11 and item four is provided by supplier number 11. And just for the sake of comprehensive example, item two is also provided by supplier number 11. So in this case, we use this uh, intersection table item supplier, which we're showing here in the middle as a way of physically implementing this conceptual many to many relationship. So you can see as illustrated here that uh, by using this lookup table in the middle, I can figure out which items are supplied by which suppliers. 
So if I ask the database, hey, database, which suppliers uh, provide me with item number two, then I can look out here in my item supplier table and say, is this item number two? No. Is this item two? Yes. Ooh, hooray. What about this one? No, this one, no, this one, yes. Okay. So I can then say the associated supplier IDs are 10 and 11. I could then follow that relationship over to the supplier table and find out more information about suppliers 10 and 11, should I choose to do so. So this is how we actually implement these many to many relationships. And we'll see that again and again and again during our remaining time together. All right. At this point, we can move beyond the conceptual relationships that were illustrated in the past several slides. And uh, we can instead enhance our capabilities by learning about cardinalities. So we'll enhance our ability to convey design information, and we'll also gain a more subtle database design capability by learning about cardinalities. Okay. So when we are looking at the relationship between two entities, that relationship, as we saw in the past several slides, is typically named, classified, or described by its cardinalities. Now, cardinality, as I put here, is a word that means count. For example, the number of items in a set. So this kind of comes out of set theory. Cardinality refers to the number of items in a set. And what we're doing here is we're using this term to refer to the number of items that are allowed to participate in a relationship between two entities. Okay. Now, when we are describing a relationship between two entities, we will typically loosely rely on its maximum cardinality for that description. Okay. So if I say that a relationship between two entities is, I don't know, one to many, like what we see here between employee and department, those are the maximum cardinalities that we're referring to, right? The one is the maximum for one part of the relationship and the many is the maximum for the other. So we're saying that the maximum number of employees that can work in a department is many. Okay, that's the upper limit. Whereas the maximum number of departments in which a specific employee can work is one. That's the upper limit. Okay. So if I loosely say something like this is a one to many relationship, those concepts those cardinalities of one and many are the maximum cardinalities. It's telling us the largest number of rows in one entity that are allowed to be related to or connected to a number of rows in the other. So the maximum cardinality here between department and employee is many, indicating that a department can have a maximum of many employees. And the maximum number of departments in which an employee can work is one. So maximum cardinalities are great. Importantly, they indicate the maximum number of entity instances that may, may participate in a relationship because it's an upper limit. We're not requiring that a specific number participate in the instance of the relationship. So for example, if I have a one-to-many relationship like I see here, this does not require that each department have many employees, right? It's a may, it's an option. A department may have many employees, but it might have just one, or maybe it has none. Maybe it's an old department that we don't have anymore and we just keep it in the database for historical reasons. So it's an upper limit, right? It's not a requirement. We could, for example, maybe we're a small company and we have just one person who works on marketing. So this sort of design would allow our marketing department to have many people, but it does not require the marketing department to have many people. It's perfectly acceptable to have just one person in the marketing department with this kind of database design. Okay. So that upper limit, the maximum cardinality is a may, right? It specifies conceptually what the upper limit is allowed to be, but does not require the upper limit to be that level. So maximum cardinalities will always be one of two things. 
one or many. So pretty small set of things that you need to remember there, right? Maximum cardinality can be one or it can be many. That's it. Now, as it says here, we can enforce the uh, maximum cardinalities by using the unique status in a foreign key. And I'll return to this concept in a moment when we take a look at minimum cardinalities, but I think it'll be important for us to understand that how we actually can enforce these notions of one or many for maximum cardinalities in our physical databases. When you build a database in SQL Server, if you want something to have a relationship of one, then we would implement a unique requirement. If many are allowed, then we would not implement a unique requirement. So we'll see that momentarily, but for now, let's move on and talk about minimum cardinalities. Okay. So uh, a minimum cardinality then is this notion of the smallest number of rows in one table that must, must participate in a relationship with another table. So this is a must in contrast to the may, which we saw with the maximum cardinality, right? When we specify a minimum cardinality, we're specifying the minimum number of rows in one table that must participate in a relationship with another table. Okay. Now, again, we have just two options for minimum cardinality, those being zero or one. And what this means is optional or mandatory. So another way of thinking about this is, are null values allowed or not? Right? That will determine the minimum cardinality for a relationship. And as you can see here, we enforce minimum cardinalities based on the null status of a foreign key. Okay. So let's take a look at these concepts then in an illustrated way so that we can understand what we're talking about here when we say maximum cardinalities are enforced by the unique status on the foreign key and minimum cardinalities are enforced by the null status on the foreign key. So let me just bring up a little blank screen upon which we can draw and we will visit a good friend of ours, a familiar example that we've seen many, many, many times. And that is the relationship between an employee and a department. Now, we should be very familiar with this by now, having seen it so many times. And let's say that we have a one to many, as we see here. And then we'll take a look at some data. So just for the sake of keeping things simple, let's imagine that we have an employee ID as our primary key. And we'll have a department ID as a foreign key in the employee table. And then over here in the department table, we'll have just a department ID. So if you remember last time, we learned about this idea of just depicting simply our entities with only the keys. And you can think of that's what's going on here. And it just shows us how these things are interconnected. So I can then fill in some data values. Maybe we have apartment 101 and 102 and 103. We don't need to provide any other non-key data because we're just interested in the connections here, right? I'm not interested in the name of the department or the location or maybe the department's phone number. Similarly, I'm not interested in my employees' names or what their phone numbers are, email addresses or anything like that, right? So let's first take a look at uh, maximum cardinalities. And we said that, uh, remember, this is, let me label this so that we all can keep this clearly in our minds. In this particular example, department ID in the employee table is a foreign key. Okay. So this is the foreign key in the relationship between employee and department, and it is the unique status and the null status of this attribute, department ID, that will be used to enforce the minimum and maximum cardinalities. 
So let's start with the maximum cardinality, which we currently see illustrated here as many. Okay. So what does it mean from a data perspective if I'm going to allow a many relationship between departments and employees? What it means is that a specific department ID can be duplicated multiple times in my foreign key column. Okay, so maybe, I don't know, employees one and three work in department 101, and maybe employees two and six and five work in 102, and then maybe employee number four works in department 103. So we have some duplicate values here in our department ID column. All right, we can see easily, right? 101 is listed here, 101 is listed here, that's fine. Here we've got some 102s, that's good. So the point is that the same value appears multiple times in this column. And that is, from a data perspective, what a many looks like as a maximum cardinality, right? Means that we can have multiple values, right? Each department can appear, each department ID can appear multiple times over here in the department ID column as a foreign key value in the employee table. So tying this back to the slide, what this is saying then is that to have a many, we cannot enforce a unique constraint on this column, right? It must be non-unique. If we were to like employee ID is unique, right? There's no duplicate values there, but department ID must be non-unique in order for the maximum cardinality to be a many. If we were to enforce a constraint on this column that its values be unique, then suddenly the maximum cardinality is no longer many, it becomes one. Okay. So let's imagine what that looks like. If I make this a unique column, so let's say that we're going to make that unique. What the effect will be is first, it will change oops, our, eh, I to get rid of that line, but very precise. It will change our maximum cardinality to one if that is unique. And I won't be able to have any duplicate values over here. Because if it's unique, that means each value appearing in the column can only appear once. All right. So if department ID is unique, then I can only have one department 101. I can only have one department 102. I can only have one department 103 in this column that we see here. So if for my foreign key department ID, if I force this to be unique, it means that the maximum cardinality is one. So this is how we enforce that, that maximum cardinality. All right. Now let's consider the concept of a minimum cardinality and minimum cardinalities can be either zero or one. Now what we're seeing, remember the, the minimum cardinality tells us the minimum number of rows in one table that must be involved in a relationship with another table okay. must be connected to some other one now what is currently illustrated here is uh, if you're thinking of null status is that null values are allowed in this design right because we can imagine that these are just some empty cells here right null values so if null values are allowed what that means is that the minimum cardinality is zero Right, because it's saying that it's possible for an employee to exist without, in this case, having a department. There's not a requirement that an employee work in a department. So the minimum number of departments that must be connected to an employee is zero. It's a minimum of zero. But now imagine a world where we do not allow null values. And if we do not allow null values, then what we currently see illustrated cannot exist. Instead, we would be required to have a value in every cell here for the foreign key, for department ID. 
Okay, so we might have something that's like this. Okay. So if we disallow null values, that is if we say department IDs are required for employees, then what the effect is that we have a minimum cardinality of one, right? Because every employee must have a department. So the minimum cardinality there is one. Interesting. So hopefully you can see through this illustration how the use of null status allows us to enforce minimum cardinalities. That is, are null values allowed or not? If they are allowed, the minimum cardinality is zero. If they are not allowed, the minimum cardinality is one. And similarly, how we can use the unique status of the foreign key, department ID in this example, as a way of enforcing the maximum cardinality. If the foreign key is unique, then the maximum cardinality must be one, right? If the foreign key is not unique, then the maximum cardinality must be many. That's how we can actually enforce it in our physical database designs. All right. So returning to our slides. So again, just connecting this visually to many people are visual learners. So. Those concepts were noted here on this slide. Maximum cardinalities are enforced by the foreign key's unique status. And then once we talk about minimum cardinalities, that same concept was noted here, right? Minimum cardinalities are enforced by the foreign key's null. So I don't know, I find this stuff interesting. Somebody figured all this out and we can use these designs to enforce the number of instances of one entity that are allowed to participate with the other.